The crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer made the world cringe. 17 murders. Cannibalism. Sex with the dead. A man who made his Milwaukee apartment into a violent and erotic death chamber. One thing led to another. It took more and more deviant type behaviors to satisfy my urges. Dahmer even tried to create living sex zombies by injecting acid into their brains. Jeffrey Dahmer, it seemed, was as close to raw evil as the world had ever known. Jeffrey thought he was the devil. Jeffrey thought he was so evil that he was equal to the devil. The first child of Joyce and Lionel Dahmer was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on May 21st, 1960, just before their first anniversary. His name was Jeffrey. It was a very happy time when Jeff was first born, and for a couple of months, it was uh, like uh, everything was brand new and, and very, uh, very, very enjoyable and happy, looking forward to the future. While Jeff's father pursued his chemistry degree, Jeff grew into a bright and loving child. He was very exuberant. He liked to wrestle. He liked to run around and ham it up the camera. And he uh, liked to play with kids. He liked to get together with them. And uh, it, he was very outgoing. Jeff was also an extremely curious child. He seemed to want to play with things and feel things and get to know their texture. and. He seemed to be very much in tune with what's around him. He just wanted to know what was going on. He had a fascination with animals as a youngster. Once four-year-old Jeff watched his father collect the bones of small animals that had died under the house. I brought him out, put him in a metal pail just to collect them all in one place, and they dropped in with sort of a clanking noise. And Jeff seemed kind of interested in that noise and he took a hold and let him drop down in too. You know, in retrospect, everything looks grim and dark and sinister. You know, like, could that be the start of something evil? Well, I have to admit, it's simply just uh, the curiosity of a child. Lionel finished his schooling with a PhD in chemistry. The family moved to Ohio, relocating three times before settling down on a nearly two-acre wooded lot in the town of Bath, an hour's drive south of Cleveland. It was then that Lionel began to notice the previously gregarious Jeff had become shy and withdrawn. He did seem to be awkward socially and just didn't feel comfortable. To take his mind off the move, seven-year-old Jeff was given a dog, Frisky, whom he loved dearly. With the uh, people that he knew or his new pet, uh, the next door neighbor boy, he was very relaxed. But there was this shyness and feeling of inferiority that, that we were concerned about at that time. What the Dahmers thought their son needed was to feel more involved, so they let Jeff choose the name of their second son. Jeff named his brother David. Lionel also encouraged his son to participate in activities that would include contact with other kids. What we were trying to do was to involve Jeff with that activities with the thought that involvement would lead to human involvement, a forced almost interaction. And on the weekends, father and son planted gardens and raised sheep for competition in 4-H fairs. To commemorate their gardening days, young Jeff gave his father a handmade card with a poem. There's a picture of me eating an ear of corn on the front, and Jeff says, the squash and the pumpkins can never compare to the kind of dad who has curly hair. And it says, this poem is from Jeff, and I love you to death. When Jeff was 10, his mother was hospitalized and treated for anxiety. From there, his parents' marriage began to fail. Jeff's fascination with nature and small animals continued into his teenage years when he became curious about what they looked like on the inside. For specimens, he collected roadkill. 
Riding around the country roads in Bath, carrying garbage bags, Jeff searched for carcasses. Jeff brought the roadkill he found into the backyard of the house, and there in the secrecy of the woods, he dissected the animals. I really have become convinced that that was sort of the starting point in this downward spiral of, uh, of his. And, and it was associated with his puberty. And when you have hormones kicking into this, this terrible mixture, uh, what he's doing, he's investigating insides of animals. And his sexuality was developing at the same time. Teenage Jeff was discovering that he felt sexually attracted only to men. But the thoughts of sex with men became interlocked with fantasies of killing another man and dismemberment. The fantasies excited him, but they were unspeakable. I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. The fantasies included lying next to an unconscious man. For the first time, Jeff's fantasies crossed the line from his mind into action. He devised a plan. He would knock out a local jogger with a bat and lie next to him. On the day he opted to wait for his victim, the jogger didn't run by. He never attempted the clubbing a second time. As he entered high school, his sexual fantasies traumatized him. To escape, he began drinking. On the way to classes in the morning, he would fill up a cup with hard liquor at a friend's house. And I remember sitting next to him in a, a first period, I believe, history class. And he had a styrofoam cup of scotch, I believe it was scotch. I remember saying, Jeff, what is that? And he threw his head back and he shook it and he said, it's my medicine. But clearly he was getting drunk at 8 o'clock in the morning. At home, Jeff was watching his parents' marriage dissolve. When their bickering escalated to open fighting, he retreated to the forested backyard, slapping tree trunks with sticks. I'd leave the house, go out in the woods and uh, sulk, brooding, you know, wondering why they had to uh, have such a rough relationship. He remained aloof with few interests and no close friendships, but he still seemed to have a sense of humor. On the high school tennis team, Jeff spent most of his time goofing around rather than playing a serious game. But more often than not, the jokes were at Jeff's expense. He gained a reputation as the class clown. Acting out in a bizarre or unexpected manner became known at his school as, quote, doing a Dahmer. All of a sudden, you'd be walking down the hall, and you'd hear someone yelling and hollering and running through the hallway, and it's Jeff Dahmer in the middle of the day, running, flapping his arms, yelling, uh, hurricane drill, hurricane drill, everybody hide. At one point, Jeff collected money from classmates in exchange for a show at the mall. And a woman is handing out samples of sunflower seeds, and Jeff is taking one, and then another, and another, and being very polite, like he always was, and then just spits them out all over the place, and starts yelling at the top of his lungs, I'm allergic, I'm allergic, I'm allergic, and runs away. During his junior year, Jeff went along on a school-sponsored trip to Washington, D.C. And Jeff said, I have an idea, let's go see the vice president. And we sort of all laughed and said, yes, sure. Vice President. Jeff went to a payphone. When he returned, he announced that they would be seen in the office of Vice President Walter Mondale in two hours. He had explained that we were high school students from Ohio working on our school newspaper and we were in town for a week and could we come and talk to someone in the Vice President's office. His slick talking worked. Dahmer had gotten his classmates inside the executive office building to meet with Mondale. In the classroom, Jeff was something of a model student. Very polite to adults, dressed very nice, very respectful to teachers. Uh, did his work. He could be an A student if he wanted to. Other times he would fail a class because he had no interest. He could be very polite with very good manners. Yes, sir. No, sir. When he spoke with teachers. 
He was perfecting his ability to fool authority figures. But as time went on, Jeff became less interested in his performance at school. No one really knew what was going on in his mind. He didn't open up to anybody. He didn't have any close friends. And he had really slipped away from his social life the older we got in high school. At the school near Bath, Ohio, Jeffrey remained an alcoholic outcast. His behavior was the subject of mockery from other students. I don't think he connected, you know, he didn't engage with people. So if you don't engage with people, then you, uh, you know, give and take of conversation and feelings, then you, you end up internalizing a lot. You're going, you, you fantasize a lot. And then the next step is to think that some of those fantasies may be real. A step Jeff was ready to make. He would kill his first victim just after high school graduation. For Jeffrey Dahmer, the summer of 1978 started with high school graduation. It would be downhill from there. His parents, after years of open and bitter fighting, divorced. Jeffrey's father, Lionel, moved out of the family house in Bath, Ohio, and into this nearby motel. Unbeknownst to Lionel, Jeff's mother took younger brother David and moved to Wisconsin. Jeffrey found himself home alone. Jeffrey was 18, and like most teens his age, he had active sexual fantasies. But Jeffrey's deviated from the norm to include thoughts of killing his lover. Now the isolation of the empty family home gave him the opportunity to act out those fantasies. Just weeks after graduation, Jeffrey picked up a hitchhiker along the road. It was 18-year-old Stephen Hicks. I wish I just kept on going, but I didn't. Turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. Jeffrey invited Hicks back to the house. They drank beers and spent a couple of hours just hanging out. Then Hicks said he had to go, but Jeffrey didn't want to be alone. He attacked Hicks, knocking him out with a barbell, and then he strangled him. Dahmer had fulfilled his fantasy, but he was lucid enough to know that he had committed a murder. He quickly began to hide the evidence. He dismembered Hicks' body with a knife, a skill he had practiced as a younger teen with roadkill. He put the pieces into trash bags and loaded them into his car in the middle of the night. He was heading for a dump site when he was pulled over by the police for drifting across the center line. The officers asked Jeff what was in the bags and why he was out so late. Jeff was trapped for the first time, but he was ready with a lie. He coolly told the cops he was troubled by his parents' divorce and couldn't sleep, so he thought a trip to the dump would take his mind off things. The police let him go with a ticket. Jeff returned home racked with guilt over the murder. He stashed the bones of Stephen Hicks under the house for two weeks. Then he smashed them to bits with a sledgehammer. Behind the house, Jeff spun in a circle, tossing the fragments among the leaves and brush. In August, Jeffrey's father stopped by the house. I said, where is your mother? Where's Dave? And he said, they're gone. I said, well, what do you mean? They're gone, they're just, they've left. Jeff's father moved back into the house. He encouraged Jeff to find a job. But Jeff wasn't interested. He spent his days drinking, even getting himself arrested for public intoxication. Lionel took his son to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and psychological counseling sessions. They had little impact. Nothing could erase the violence and terror his first murder had imprinted on his mind. Only the alcohol seemed to provide relief. By the end of the summer, Jeff was still jobless, so Lionel suggested an alternative, college. He enrolled Jeff at Ohio State. But Jeff spent the entire first quarter in a drunken stupor, selling his blood to plasma centers and spending the money on beer. Predictably, Dahmer flunked out and returned home. I said, Jeff, the doors are closing. Um, I think 
perhaps that the armed services might be something that you need. Like all the other choices that had been made for him, Jeff passively went along with his enlistment. After his basic training was complete, he left for an army hospital in San Antonio, Texas, where he was given specialized instruction as a field medic. There, Dahmer learned more about human anatomy. For one of the first times in his life, he was excited about what he was doing, responding to instruction and discipline. After six months in the army, his sluggish body had become lean and strong. Normally shy and reclusive, Jeff became outgoing, even smiling. But the mood swing was temporary. The army sent him for a tour of duty in Germany, and there, once again, Jeff emptied bottle after bottle. His superiors noticed and gave Dahmer an early discharge. He went directly to Miami Beach without contacting his family. He worked in a sandwich shop and lived out of a motel. When his booze bills exceeded the room costs, Jeff took to sleeping on the beach. And he was terrified one night when a rat, a big, huge rat came crawling over him, and he called us. He said, we, he needs some money. I said, we won't send you money, but we'll send you a ticket. You come home. So I met him at the airport. Cleveland Hopkins Airport, and uh, he had a smile on his face. But as I got closer, it wasn't a smile of happiness. It was a smile of inebriation. Lionel tried for a year to help his alcoholic son to no avail. Jeff was sent to stay with his father's mother near Milwaukee. There, he seemed to find some stability at last, making a concentrated effort to turn his life around. He stopped drinking went to church with his grandmother, and he fought what he believed were immoral homosexual urges, which eventually led to his inescapable fantasies about murder. Dahmer even found jobs, first at a blood bank, and then working nights as a chocolate mixer in a candy factory. But the lifestyle of church-going and right living, as he called it, didn't last. After three quiet years in his grandmother's home, Jeff came face to face with his fears. At the library, a man handed him a note offering sexual favors. Dahmer declined, but he would later say the note was a turning point. It awakened sexual desires deep inside him. Specifically, he wanted the submissive company of another male. He wanted someone to fulfill his sexual needs, but he didn't want to be burdened by anyone else's needs. Jeffrey started with a perfectly submissive partner. He stole a store window mannequin. He kept the plastic man in his closet, bringing it out to masturbate onto until his grandmother found it and insisted he get rid of it. On his free nights, Jeffrey began exploring gay life in Milwaukee, browsing through porn shops and going to bathhouses. The bath clubs catered mostly to men seeking anonymous sex. To make his partners there submissive, Jeffrey gave them drinks laced with sleeping pills. When they fell unconscious, he would lie down next to them, listening to the sounds of their bodies, their heartbeats, their stomachs. But the drugging experiments ended when one man overdosed and spent a week in the hospital. Jeff was asked never to return to the club. But he then discovered the gay bars and discos of Milwaukee. These would become the killer's favorite hunting ground. By his late 20s, Jeffrey Dahmer was settled in Milwaukee, living at his grandmother's and prowling the city's gay scene. No one suspected that this reclusive loner with boyish good looks was on his way to becoming a psychopathic serial killer. He did take pleasure in the fact that he was in control of his own little world, that nobody knew what was going on, that he was the master of it. Dahmer could fit in with any group, and you wouldn't say, oh, he must be crazy, or he must be a killer. That's why he was so successful. He was not a repulsive individual. Certainly not in Milwaukee's gay nightclubs. We have it on good facts that he was considered somewhat of a honey in the gay community, that people found him attractive. Uh, several people told us that he was the kind of guy that you wanted to take care of, you wanted to baby him. But Dahmer had very specific requirements for his men. He chose a body style. He liked long, lean, smooth, muscular, 
uh, body styles. And it didn't matter if they were black, white, yellow, red, or brown. If he found them attractive, he would try to, to get them. In November 1987, Dahmer met 25-year-old Steve Toomey at a downtown club called 219. After a few drinks, they left the bar for a night at the nearby Ambassador Hotel. Dahmer used an old trick to get Toomey into the submissive state he craved. I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him conscious. And I uh, was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, my forearms were bruised, and his chest was, was bruised, and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. And uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. But Dahmer didn't panic. He went out and bought the biggest suitcase he could find. At the hotel, he crammed Toomey's body into the case, dragged it into a taxi, went back to his grandmother's house, and dismembered to me in the basement. That's when the, the obsession went into full swing. He decided after that second death that he would no longer attempt to control his desires, that he would give full reign to them, yield entirely to them, and after that, his life became the pursuit of unmitigated sexual pleasure. Dahmer now decided to pursue his fantasies of ultimate control. It was no longer enough to have his partners submissive just for a night. He wanted to keep them that way forever. So with the intent to murder and then butcher the men he picked up, Dahmer returned to the clubs. At a bus stop outside 219, he met 14-year-old James Doc Stater. Dahmer offered him $50 to spend the night with him. They took the bus back to Dahmer's grandmother's. While she slept, Jeff and Doc Stater had oral sex. Then Dahmer drugged and strangled him, his preferred method for killing. He stated in no way did he ever want to hurt anybody, as, as funny as this sounds. That is the reason why he killed everyone by strangling them, because not only did he get the, the power and the thrill of committing the murder, but it was also the most humane way. With Doc Stater, Dahmer further explored his dark fantasies. He hid the body in the basement for a week and continued to have sex with it. Most serial killers are sexual deviates who are uh, who are social and psychological sociopaths and, and sexual, uh, sexual paths who kill people for their own sexual gratification. Dahmer's was different than that. He was a true necrophiliac. He was trying to have sex with an unconscious or dead person. Once James Doc Stater began to decay, Dahmer dismembered him in the basement near a floor drain, just as he had with Toomey. Dahmer was now drinking heavily again, especially on the nights he planned to murder. By the time he killed, he would be stone drunk. He drank because his conscience was so strong. This isn't a man that didn't know the difference of right from wrong. Two months after killing Doc Stater, Dahmer picked up 21-year-old Richard Guerrero from a Milwaukee bar, again offering him money to spend the night. In a familiar pattern, Dahmer drugged and strangled him. He spent a few hours with the corpse before dismembering it. He then placed the body parts into trash bags for the city garbage collection the next day. In the summer of 1988, Jeff's grandmother asked him to move out she had been troubled by Jeff's late hours, the mannequin in his bedroom, and now unidentified foul smells from the basement. He took an apartment on Milwaukee's west side and immediately accelerated his downward spiral when he approached a 13-year-old boy on the street and lured him into the apartment. Inside, Dahmer scared the boy by fondling him, and the youngster ran from the apartment. Dahmer was convicted on second-degree sexual assault charges only. The murders were still his secret. He was sentenced to one year in a work release program that required him to spend his nights in a prison dormitory while he continued working at the chocolate factory. In the 10 days before he began his sentence, Dahmer struck again. He met 26-year-old Anthony Sears at the gay club Lacage and killed him. He mummified Sears' head and genitals and kept them inside his locker at the chocolate factory. 
Towards the end of the work release term, Jeff's father wrote to the judge and urged him to put Jeff in an alcoholic treatment program, writing, I have tremendous reservations regarding Jeff's chances when he hits the streets. No program was ordered. Jeff was released two months early. He moved into another low-income neighborhood in Milwaukee. The rent at the Oxford Apartments was cheap, and the location was close to the gay clubs. On his own again, he was free to feed his relentless sexual urges. Within three weeks of his release, Dahmer began a one-year killing frenzy. He would leave 13 more families, most of them African-American, searching for loved ones who had simply disappeared. The police, too, searched in vain. Once Jeff started on his killing spree, all of his financial resources, all of his time, money, effort, desires, emotions, thoughts, went into his secret world of killing people and, and keeping them with him. Many times he talked about trying to fight it, even after he had killed a couple people, saying how he wasn't going to do it again. But within a month, he would be out back out at the bar stalking. One victim almost got away. Dahmer had drugged 14-year-old Conorak Synthesimphone, the brother of the boy Dahmer had been jailed for molesting the year before. As Conorak slept, Dahmer went out to buy more liquor. But while he was gone, the teen woke up. He staggered out into the street naked. A concerned neighbor called 911. Emergency operator 71. Okay, hi. Um, this um, I'm on 25th and State, and this is young man. He is butt naked. He has been beaten up. He is very bruised up. He can't stand. He study fall out. He has he is butt naked. He has no clothes on. He was really hurt. Police arrived. By this time, Dahmer had returned from his beer run. As he had with police in Bath, Ohio, after his first killing, Dahmer smoothly lied. He told police that Conorak was his gay lover who simply had too much to drink. He brought the cops into his apartment and showed them Polaroids he'd taken of the teen, proof, he said, of their relationship. The police believed the 14-year-old was of legal age and left him behind with Dahmer. They wrote the incident off as a lover's quarrel. Again, Dahmer had been slippery enough to keep his killings a secret. As soon as the cops left, he murdered the boy. Inside Dahmer's apartment, the bodies began to pile up. So he bought a 57-gallon drum and filled it with a powerful acid to dissolve the dismembered limbs and torsos. After weeks in the acid, the remains of Dahmer's would-be lovers became sludge, which he flushed down the toilet or the bathtub drain. For others, Jeffrey boiled the skin off their bones on the stove. A sweet, bitter odor of death began to infest the building, and many tenants traced the smells straight to Dahmer's door. It's awful funny, whatever Jeff was cooking, Jeff never bought no groceries. So what could he have been cooking that smelled like chitlins? Chitlins have a very peculiar, nasty odor to them, <laughs> you know. Dahmer was pathologically lonesome, not wanting his sexual partners to leave him even after death. He took keepsake photos while removing their flesh and then preserved certain parts. And one thing led to another. It took, it took more and more uh, deviant type behaviors to satisfy uh, my urges. He devised a plan to build a shrine out of skeletons and skulls, but he was still in search of the perfect partner, one who was completely submissive, but alive and not prone to decay. On a few still living victims, Dahmer used a power drill to open small holes in their skulls. Then he injected acid into their brains. According to Dahmer, none of his experimental zombies lived longer than a day. And in perhaps the ultimate effort to keep his victims with him, Dahmer began eating their flesh. It made me feel like they were a permanent part of me. Besides, besides the just mere curiosity of what it would be like, it made them feel that they were a part of me and it gave me a, a sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that. Throughout this year of ruthless killing, Dahmer still appeared outwardly normal. In this video, taken at his grandmother's house on Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. Dahmer talked calmly with his father. Well, you're looking good. Grandma was saying that, that she thought that you got quite a bit thinner, but you look fit. I don't know. 
Well, I've been surviving mostly on McDonald's food. It's just so much easier just to pop into a restaurant. But yeah, like I've said before, it gets too expensive, and it does. I have to start eating at home more. It's amazing how he could sit there and and appear like he's you know clean cut, nice jacket on, and talking very hopefully about his job, uh, intelligent. Uh, it's amazing how much a human being can, can hide from another human being. But careful as he was, Jeffrey Dahmer was about to run out of good lives. In July 1991, the city of Milwaukee discovered a serial killer, 31-year-old Jeffrey Dahmer. One man, Tracy Edwards, had managed to escape from the horrors of Dahmer's apartment and flagged down a passing patrol car. When the officers entered the apartment, they found 83 Polaroids of bodies in various stages of dismemberment. There were more shocking discoveries in the kitchen. There were four fully enfleshed skulls still there, sitting in a refrigerator. One of the officers said he opened the icebox. He heard a scream. It was only later that he realized that it was he himself who had screamed. TV news cameras rolled as what was left of the victims was carried out. The 57-gallon drum filled with the torsos of three men. A freezer with dismembered limbs and flesh. Metal cooking pots with mummified hands and genitals. This time, there was no lie Dahmer could tell to save himself. He was walking in a pretty defeated manner. His shoulders were hunched, his head was down. Uh, he was sweating profusely. He kind of had a kind of a faint, kind of a whining, like a baby crying noise about him. At the police station, detectives began a marathon interview with the suspected killer. Dahmer at first blamed the booze instead of himself, saying he wouldn't have been caught if he hadn't been so drunk. But Dahmer was now clearly scared. The look of terror and almost hysteria that he had on his face in the interrogation room that first night as he was coming down off the alcohol and finally realizing that the gig was up. He was caught. Uh, he, he did cry several times. Uh, he went into a rage besides asking to kill himself. He stood up and pounced around a couple times. Once Dahmer sobered up, no one could guess at the gruesome details to follow. He made this statement, when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, you're going to be famous. And I tried to say, look, Jeff, there's nothing that you can tell me that is going to freak me out. And he, he laughed at that. He said, you don't know. You don't know what I've done. Dahmer spent the next six weeks with the detectives recounting the murders of 17 men, a 159-page confession. It seemed cathartic to Dahmer to finally get the deeds of the last 13 years off his chest. With the information from his confession, investigators went back to Dahmer's childhood home in Bath, Ohio. They raked up the shattered bones of Stephen Hicks, Dahmer's first victim. The Milwaukee County coroner started matching skulls with torsos and the police began the sad task of notifying families. Dahmer pleaded guilty but insane. The issue of his sanity would be the sole question before the jury. You know immediately that it's going to be probably an insanity defense. What can you argue? You can't claim self-defense. You can't say you don't know how those bodies got there. Wisconsin had no death penalty, so if the jury found him sane, he would spend the rest of his life in prison. If they found him insane, he would be imprisoned in a mental facility. Dahmer himself couldn't understand why he enjoyed fantasizing about murder. Jeffrey thought he was the devil. Jeffrey thought he was so evil that he was equal to the devil. And he knew there was something wrong with him, but he didn't know what it was. But he never categorized himself as being insane. The man who entered the Milwaukee County courtroom in January 1992 appeared completely normal until the words of his confession were read in court by Lieutenant Dennis Murphy. He related this was a person he really liked. He indicated that he had filleted his heart and kept it in the freezer and he also kept his bicep. 
He indicated that he had eaten the thigh muscle of this subject, but it was so tough he could hardly chew it. He then purchased a meat tenderizer and used it on the bicep. Dahmer's father, Lionel, sat in the courtroom beside his second wife, Sherry, stunned by what he heard. No one softened the blow for us. No one told us, no one prepared us with any of these details. How could this be? How could I have not known about it? Dahmer's crimes seem to be devastating proof of insanity. What else could explain the actions of a man who had sex with the dead, dismembered their bodies, preserved their skulls, and ate their flesh, all for sexual gratification? But the law has a very strict interpretation of insanity. Dahmer's defense team had to prove two things. One, that he indeed suffered from a mental disease, and that it kept him from knowing right from wrong. Necrophilia, a compulsion to have sex with the dead, is recognized as a sexual disorder, but it does not make one legally insane. He argued that the, the necrophilic drive was such that he could not control it. But we don't accept that in the United States as a defense, no more than we accept a pedophilic drive of the man who wants to have sex with children. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I understand you have arrived at verdicts in this manner. In a 10 to 2 decision, the jury found Jeffrey Dahmer legally sane. Some relatives of Dahmer's victims sat quietly in court, others cried. Prior to his sentencing, they were allowed to express themselves before the judge. Jeffrey, I hate you! Once order was restored, Dahmer spoke publicly for the first time. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I have seen their tears, and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. I am so very sorry. Many questioned the emotional depth of Dahmer's apology, whether a man who killed so routinely had the conscience to feel remorse. The judge sentenced Dahmer to a 937-year prison term, but it would last only a few tormented years. Jeffrey Dahmer's final home was the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. His former residence at the Oxford Apartments in Milwaukee stood as a painful reminder of the lives that ended there. So in November 1992, it was demolished. In his prison cell at the age of 32, Dahmer's life became a conflicted introspection, trying to sort out the blame for his killing nature and seeking divine forgiveness for it. He had spent time in church as a boy and with his grandmother as an adult, but had lost his religion during the murder spree. Dahmer placed the blame for the murders on his atheistic beliefs and the theory of evolution. He said, if it all happens naturalistically, what's the need for a God? Can't I set my own rules? Who owns me? I own myself. Yet Jeffrey was still a contradiction, for he was always quite willing to blame the devil for taking over his soul. The serial killer wondered now what would happen to him when he died. Dahmer decided he wanted to be baptized. Evangelist Roy Ratcliffe was called by the prison minister to talk with the inmate in April 1994. He was a very affable, uh, congenial, likable sort of person. I always felt like I was dealing with a small boy in a grown-up man's body. Uh, he could get real excited and interested in neat or cool things that a little boy would get involved in. One month later, Dahmer was taken to the prison medical center where he was baptized in a whirlpool. And on the way, we, we walked by other prisoners who were coming by with mops and brooms and various cleaning devices. And they looked up and the only one they saw whom they recognized was Jeff. And so they called out in a very friendly, you know, banter, hey, uh, JD, how's it going? And he called back, I'm going to be baptized, this is great. Dahmer appeared to be making a remarkable transformation in prison. He would ask questions. He would 
he would say, but wait, what about this? What about that? So uncharacteristic of the earlier years. You know, go back to senior year in high school, you wouldn't get any of that. He was so interactive and so concerned about our welfare. You know, it, he was reaching out. He was, he was rehumanizing. But those dark, haunted fantasies remained with Dahmer. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Dahmer got another reminder of his past when he was visited by Teresa Smith. Jeffrey had killed her brother, Eddie. First thing when he did when he, when he came in is apologize for killing my brother. I asked him why my brother, and he said he seen the way he danced, you know, and um, he liked the way he looked, and he said I was just attracted to him. He said he had strangled him, and um, then he was trying some new experiment or something with uh, preserving the, the skull and the body and whatever, and it didn't work. So he had to destroy him. Dahmer had spent his entire adult life as the predator. But now in prison, he became the prey. The notorious serial killer was a target for other inmates. In August 1994, he was attacked in the prison chapel with a crudely fashioned knife. He survived. But on November 29, 1994, inmate Christopher Scarver, who called himself Christ, bludgeoned Dahmer with a metal rod from the prison gym. Dahmer died on the way to the hospital. Among his last wishes, Dahmer had asked to be cremated. His ashes were split between his mother and father. There are statements in his will and testament that say, I don't want a marker, I don't want a grave, I don't want a funeral, I don't want any kind of... He's saying, I don't... I, don't, I want to be wiped out. But the horrible questions that his life of killing posed do continue and they defy answers. It's a mystery of mysteries that will never be solved, even if he lived. I don't know that what he was all about would ever be solved, except maybes. It's hard when there's no explanations. Sure, there were red flags in Jeff's life, but no one knew about him. He was so secretive and so careful. 